Hello, everyone. So I can't find the notes I wrote just last week. They must be within view, but I don't have them. However, I remember what we did. We talked about the linearity of the mean. We talked about the quadratic nature of the variance. We talked about a weighted mean and its variance. We talked about a general linear combination of variables whose statistical properties we will want to know, like their means, their covariances. I then went back and forth, uh, made a mistake on what the general uh, example was when it was specialized. And so in the end, we ended up having two cases. Bottom line of it is, if you have a vector of variables, x, y, z, u, v, w, or just in general, big X, and you want to turn that into another vector of different variables like X plus Y and X plus V plus T and X plus two Y plus V minus three T. In other words, a general linear combination of this variable set X that results in a new set Z. So that's a application of one vector being equal to a matrix dot product with another vector, then we have derived, or rather, you know, sort of ended up with the general rule of how to compute the covariance matrix of that new vector of variables. And it was simply pre-multiplying what you started with, the covariance of X, with the matrix of the linear transformation, A on the left and A transpose on the right. Oh, that's right. And then I went through how you all might want to simulate yourself some pairs of correlated variables to find yourself some examples of what correlation really means. And I referred it to the picture with the two rows of data, um, correlated, not correlated, uh, just a blob of data, the difference between independence, which leads to no correlation, and absence of correlation, which does not mean independence necessarily. And those point clouds, which I grabbed from the Wikipedia, were no doubt generated by uh, the transformation that I told you about, where if you start from a set of variables, a vector collection of variables distributed with a unit covariance, which means every one of their variances is one, every one of their covariances is zero. Regardless of the distribution, it didn't have to be normal, but I did start with that. And then you transform them according to the square root of the desired variance covariance matrix. Then your new variables have the desired covariance matrix. If your new variables are that square root of that variance times the set that you begin with. If you didn't write this down and you weren't, haven't reviewed your notes, this monologue is not gonna make any sense. However, if you have written it down and you have looked at it, then this should make perfect sense. If you have looked at it and there's anything unclear, I'd be happy to talk about it again. But if not, I'll just say, you all know what happens to variances and expectations when you do linear transformations of variables. And sometimes you use that for constructive purposes to generate simulations. So that is a part of the story, and I'll pick up on that today. But I think also what I want to do is to talk a little bit more about what we are really always trying to do. The philosophy will stay with us through the chapters. And that is assessing a state of knowledge in the very, very general sense. Okay. As in, what are we really, really trying to do, whatever we do? All of us in the sciences are dealing with properties that we want to know. S, or temperature, whatever it is. A state of truth, a thing that we know exists, or rather we postulate it exists. And you got to immediately think about this as, Aha, that's right, a random variable, which means, aha, something that has a PDF, a probability density function associated with it, something that is in principle knowable, okay? 
not infinite infinite and however and whatever we do complete guesswork making a measurement doing it wrong we will treat something that we derive based on data or complete guesswork or being completely tangential or orthogonal to the problem but something that purports to relate to s to teach us what s really is with um, air quotes that's going to get a hat okay so the estimate is really whatever you do my estimate for the average height in the class here is that you're all about five and a half feet tall okay so really what we want to know is how good is an estimate and yes i'd like to uh, have you think back to the truth being a property that relates to a population whereas an estimate typically is going to come from a sample the temperature at noon today i may go out and measure it that's a sample of the population of random variables of the temperatures at noon and yet i can only take one value at noon in one place but of course i can take a hundred values with a hundred thermometers in a hundred places nearby and so i might think of a sample of the population of temperatures at noon in and around Princeton. Okay, so typically the sample involves data, but anyone familiar with contemporary politics knows you can also just guess. That's a model. And typically the population is characterized by these model parameters. And model here is, you know, used loosely because language that we can get into later. Think of a population as being characterized by model parameters that that is reflective of the property we want to know and that we're going to go out in the field take data or uh, uh, whatever measure we come up with we call that an estimate and that's typically derived from a small set of things. so um, the three or maybe four key points of what it means to be good are the following. If you have an estimate as hat, that means you have a procedure for arriving at a model for your true parameters. And you must think of that as something that's typically involved in data, you can do again and again and again so this itself is a random variable and however you do it you must imagine and this is literally imagined typically that you can do this a million times and that so you can ask yourself what if i use the same procedure a million times on different data sets, but always the same thing. I always take my thermometer out at noon and I do that a million times. And so you can, you want, need to get into the idea now that this estimate that you made has itself an expectation, okay? So uh, whatever the method is, I can take your group, split you guys in half, not physically, but rather by numbers, take out my ruler, measure your height, and take your arithmetic average height, and then I have one estimate of the height of the human population on the left, and I have another one on the right. And so um, if I did that a hypothetical million times, I would want to know if that method of estimation in expectation was any good. And the measure that we use is to say, let's compare it by subtraction to the truth. Give me a name for this property if you have an idea or not. It measures a kind of deviation or something 
It is certainly a deviation. So it's a deviation of the expectation of a sample or rather of an estimate of the property, the true value of that property. I was going to say it's a kind of error or something. Uh, yeah. Okay. You know what? I'm going to write your word error and I'll say, sure, this, I'm going to give you that right here. I will say, if I have one estimate and I compare it to the truth, mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to definitely call this error. My error is I'm wrong. Is that error the same as the residual for that data point? Uh, a good name for an error also, yes. But, so what is the word in everyday language? This is one of the rare cases where it transfers, where you're like, always falling on the wrong side of the judgment systematically implicitly or explicitly consciously or unconsciously bias bias okay a lot of talk about it but let's not forget that this now has a proper statistical definition the bias is the difference the deviation from the truth that your estimator displays on average. And intuitively you'll see that if I make the misjudgment a thousand times, a million times, if I throw my dice 800,000 times and the six faces don't come up roughly in the same proportion, well, I'll rough it up, then my die is biased. Okay, so that's the definition of bias. The definition of error or residual is when you're considering one thing compared to the truth. Bias is when you consider the expectation of that one thing as a random variable, as something you've made, constructed, estimated from data, typically. Okay. Well, what is the... I'm going to write it from the inside out and then read it from the outside in. What is the expectation of the squared deviation of an estimate from its expectation? Would that be some kind of variance? It is a variance. It's indeed the variance of the estimate. I think we have written it in so many words. It was an X before, now it's an S and an S hat. So that is the variance of the estimate. I'm gonna do you one more and say, what am I going to call the expectation of the squared distance of the estimate to the truth? This felt like another kind of variance to me, so I think I'm wrong. It cannot be a variance because it doesn't refer anything to a property of itself, like this one does. It's s hat s hat. It is a, it is an expected squared distance of something to something else. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's like the error between what you're observing. It's the error squared. It's error squared, and it's the then expectation of the error squared. Well, yes, that's all correct. And so it mm -hmm. then gets a special privilege name, the mean squared error, MSC. Because it's something that we have done before, I'll just call it epsilon squared in expectation. Okay. So because of all of that, and it's something that you will want to do, I mean, we've already related this variance earlier on to the expectation of the property squared minus the square of the property in expectation. We can now work this out and get to something that I ultimately find important for you to know. And that is that the mean squared error is really the sum of the variance plus the bias squared, okay? That follows straight from the above. 
so these properties, but really it's bias invariance because they contain the error and they contain the mean square error. Those are the two things that we're going to always, always, always characterize when we do anything at all. And now I need to give you a sense of what does it mean to be good? You didn't come here for philosophical advice, but this is clearly a question that is on humankind's mind. Being unbiased is one form of being good. But I'm going to argue is not the only form of being good. And in fact, it's not the best form of being good. So having no bias means that on average, you're never wrong. Low variance means that you're not erratic in your judgments, in your estimates, in your being right about things. And an important question that you need to ask is to say, well, I don't know what low means, right? So more importantly than being low is knowing what trajectory you're on. And so you must talk about the rate of improvement of lowering of your variance and the really good thing that you want to strive for is for the property of consistency. And that I don't think is the same in everyday language, but consistency means that the sequence of estimators, if you keep trying it, if you keep taking more data, that you converge on the truth at a good rate. So I'm just going to write it in, keep estimating, keep taking more data, and you want to converge with your estimator to the truth at a good rate. It is not good enough to tell people that if you have infinite time, you'll get your problem set in perfectly correctly. That may be true, but it's useless. You want to say that if you spend an hour, you'll do 50%. If you spend two hours, you'll 75. And if you spend three hours, you are 100% right. And somebody who will be better than you will converge faster with fewer tries. And so consistency relates to how your estimate keeps getting better statistically as you add samples, add procedures, add trials, not different procedures, but keep doing the same thing. And the uh, question of whether you actually then converge to the truth and whether that convergence rate is, is good, that is a, a property we want to ask about. And I'll give you a good example in a minute. And then finally, this is the highest good. This is, you really would want to have a minimum mean squared error, okay? So converging to the truth is one thing. Converging with a good rate is another thing. But in the end, you also need to converge to um, a um, value that has the least mean squared errors of any other procedure you might ever try. And this is again philosophical in this sense, but it also will be statistically well founded sooner than later, where there is such a notion of what is the best you could do that does exist. And then if you're not doing the best you can do, maybe you still get close but the best estimator is going to be the one that is consistent and has minimum mean squared error. And the terms floating around are efficiency. You by now notice that my capital I still have a dot on them, okay? Um, 
So efficiency means converging to some sort of a, a best possible state. I will give you through the course examples of estimators that are biased. I'll give you estima uh, estimators that are inconsistent. And it'll be very easy to give you estimate, estimators that are inefficient. And so for almost anything that you do, you want to ask yourself that question and you can ask yourself that question. And those are the three criteria. Sorry, I can't read what you wrote for the efficiency. What does that say? Converge to a best possible MSE, mean squared error state. And before that I wrote, keep estimating, keep taking data, converge to truth at a good rate. Qualitative, but we'll see examples right away. Let me give you a picture now of something that I hope is at least partially surprising. What would you raise as the most surprising thing about the following three things I have said? A good estimator does not need to be unbiased because I'll prioritize minimum mean square error. And what I'm saying that I think should be at least somewhat surprising is that um, we can be biased. At this point, uh, the joke of the physicist, the engineer, and the statistician comes to mind. That drives this point home. So they're out hunting, the engineer shoots and um, misses the deer by two feet to the left. And the physicist takes another shot and they miss the deer by two feet to the right. And the statistician says, we got him. Because on average, they shot the deer. That was an unbiased estimator that did not result in any venison. So, um, I just want to make a graph that has the variance of an estimator on it of whatever it is, and also the bias of that same estimator, whatever it is. And on this axis here is a property that um, I'm just going to call the property. It's a tweak. It's something you do. And again, I'm going to give you more examples, but for now, I must say completely abstract. And um, you can think of the property as, as some continuous thing that scales between not doing anything at all and doing a lot of it. All right? Some procedure, some tweak. Again, I'll give you real examples, but the curves will always look the same. So I'm going to begin by showing them here. And so now what happens is that very, very often you will be able to make an estimator that is unbiased when you're just doing it. And then if you change something about your procedure, you're doing it slightly wrong on average, in other words, that you increase the bias, okay? And then you look at that and you go, well, no, don't do this thing because your results are getting on average worse. Mm, I'm not a hunter, so I can barely carry this analogy, but Maybe there's something that you could do to the barrel of your gun. It makes it worse, right? Maybe you, know, you are getting the deer on average and you're doing something to it in your procedure that, that actually makes this worse. You're no longer even hitting the deer. However, many of those same estimators will, when they are unbiased in like their standard naked form, have a high variance. And then very often, and as I'll show, show with real examples, those estimators, as you deliberately introduce some bias to the procedure, will diminish their variance. So clearly, this is a notion of good down in variance, and this is a notion of badness on bias. But the mean squared error is the statistical definition of quality here that we're going to most espouse and not drawn to scale necessarily. Remember 
the variance plus the bias squared in the beginning, you know, just have that high variance and no bias, and then you're lowering the variance and then you're adding the squared bias, and you're going to often be at a minimum. And so personally, I'm mostly enamored by that idea statistically, that the best estimator has the minimum squared deviation from the truth in expectation. And that typically comes about by having a slight bias, which buys you a lot of variance in the variance bias trade-off, and that will then be vastly preferable. So that's the general form of a lot of curves that uh, we will return to that show you that uh, certain things that we will be doing to estimating procedures will be biasing the result of our estimate, but will be purchased against a strongly diminished variance, which in sum, in conclusion, will lead to a lowering of the mean squared error. And then you might have a consistent and an efficient, if slightly biased estimator. But you have to think about that when you do your own experiment. So I also think it's a good idea to draw one more picture and maybe do something that you've all seen that we'll just do it anyway. So I'm drawing four circles, concentric. One more, I'm drawing a target and now I'm shooting at it. You can wait to draw the crosses until I'm finished and I'm gonna ask you questions. Okay, so top left, high bias, low bias, high variance, low variance, you tell me. Uh, so it would be a low variance, but high bias. Okay. So are we just, so we're kind of thinking of bias and variance as being equivalent to accuracy precision? Is that one way? Yes, yes, I was, I, uh, I was gonna write those words right, uh, right under here also, yes. Um, right, highly biased, because on average you're very wrong, and yet it's pretty tight. Your estimate is good, you just need to correct it a little bit. This is an example of a low mean squared error where, you know, in this case, I have a tight shot. All I need to do is back correct it. Clearly in hunting, that's not gonna really, well, they probably will do that, um, but maybe too late if you're hunting for deer. Okay, top to the right. You have high variance, but low bias. High variance, low bias. Um, I don't think that's an instrument that you would purchase, something that gave you erratic temperature readings and it was just, you know, the sort of being right twice a day for every clock. Bottom left. That would be low bias and low variance. And bottom right. High variance and high bias. Wrong on average by a lot, wildly varying. Okay, so I spend my time on it just never forget this. I always think of these targets when I make sense of things. We always do prefer a low variance, unbiased estimate. Guess what? Because if there is no bias and you minimize the variance, you will have a minimum mean squared error. It's on record, but I'll say it again. If you have an estimator and you have succeeded by construction in minimizing its bias and getting rid of it all together, and then you minimize its variance, then you have minimized the mean square error and you're golden. That's clearly the very best. But I would say a second closest is, you know, maybe you can't completely rule out your bias, or maybe you deliberately introduced it in order to lower the variance, and then you might have a biased low variance estimate that you still really like, because then there might be ways of interpreting your data um, by accounting for the systematic error. And then really you never want high bias, high variance estimates. They're gonna be always terrible. And if you have a low bias and high variance estimate, I would argue, you know, maybe the only redeeming grace is that 
the rate at which this variance improves actually works in your favor and you could just go for it with tons and tons and tons of data. And actually that is also a procedure that um, people are using. Um, you know, sort of scattershot approaches to, um, well, shooting ducks maybe, I guess. But there's clearly also scientific approaches where you um, just shove in the data, you have a lot, you keep coming and then your variance might improve at a, at a, at a auspicious rate. And if you're then having a low bias to begin with, then you can still end up with a good estimator. So clearly these targets here are snapshots of situations. I've drawn the same number of crosses on each. I have not drawn what happens as you increase the number of crosses. Um, I haven't drawn that any of that decay or the rate. Okay. Um, so those are hopefully useful measures of quality. And yes, now finally, accuracy relates to bias and precision relates to variance. I will try to avoid using these terms, although I think I'm all right with them, just because um, very often people confuse them in everyday language and it's clear what they mean and you just have to back correct it and it just makes no sense. So, but yeah, accuracy, an accurate estimate is right on average. A precise estimate doesn't wildly vary and that doesn't tell you anything about being right on average. In fact, it may be wrong on average. Okay. So I'm gonna take these estimators of quality and literally they will come back all the time in this lecture, every other lecture. So now I'm gonna take these particular notions and I'm gonna apply them to estimators of the mean and variance that uh, are now naturally on our, on our block. Now I'm switching back to X being my property. And, um, you know, I'll say I have some property X. And I take data, samples, measurements, observations, and I um, call them X sub I, or I goes to one to N. And I will say about them that these are independently, identically distributed. So if my property that I wanna know is the human height, then really I say, give me any human. Next, next, walk into the door. And every time I take a new doctor with a new ruler, and I take n such observations. So these things have nothing to do with one another. Other than that, it parades samples one by one, and I can treat those that sample, every element of it, as a draw from my population. Okay, the human that comes through the door is a draw from the population of humans, and my independent identical procedure is take any doctor with any ruler and make a measurement. And then you all know that an estimator for the mean is... For um, I equals one through N, is N the population size or is it the sample size? So this is the size of this sample. Okay. Um, the population really has no size. That's uh, maybe a little bit counterintuitive, right? But I, I do want to think about the population as this thing that, you know, there is a human height and it is a population that, that I do not care to define as a size, but it is characterized by a probability density distribution whose expectation and variance I now wish to estimate by taking n data points from it. So let me draw it this way. 
here is human height. I'm not telling you anything about this being normally distributed or not. I just say it exists. It has a probability density function. In fact, I know it probably will be several peaks because, you know, subgroups have different heights and countries and healthcare systems and whatnot. People drinking milk versus not. Um, but I'm saying there is an X. It has an expectation, which I'll call mu of X. It has a variance, which I call sigma squared of X. So I have a sense of location. I have a sense of spread for which I'll take sigma X not squared since to scale, right? Where is human height? How variable it is. And I'm gonna try to get it by taking n samples from it and excess is my sample. Mm -hmm. So from my 13 samples of human height, I have to figure out what the population is and um, unestimated for the mean is, well, I'm gonna give it a hat to show you that's my estimator. All of you can come up with your own estimators. One of them would be, I'll just guess it. The other one is, I'll take my brother's height. Another one is, um, I did the experiment last year, I'll take last year's values. But if I write for you that an estimator is, take the data you have just taken, all N of them, and sum them up, and normalize by one over N, this is an estimator for the mean, namely the arithmetic average. All right. Then if you've written it down, you owe yourself to answer the question, how good is it? And so you ought to start by saying, well, I'll start working on the bias and I'll start working on the variance. And I went through the linearity of the expectation to write, hopefully without any trouble, through, if I take an expectation of my estimator, then it's the expectation of the right-hand side which is a product of things, a constant, which doesn't have any other expectation than itself. So that's one over N. The expectation of a sum. Well, I told you about the linearity. So the sum that just carries straight through. And I'm left with the expectation of the XIs. And I've argued that these XIs are drawn from the population that they're identically distributed. They're all from that distribution. They have no correlation, nothing else going on for them. And so individually, the expectations of these X's are the expectation of the population from which they are drawn. And so sticking averaging brackets on this expression above immediately reveals that the expectation of this estimator. And now I'm going to subtract the truth. Is one over n on which the expectation brackets have no bearing. Sum over i from one to n. Expectation brackets. I'm going to write this out once, but I'll tire of it, right? So you're going to do this a few times. And now I subtract it again, MX. I'll make some room here. And now I'm just arguing that the whole experiment here is predicated on that being equal to MX, mu X. I will often say the Latin equivalent of the Greek letter, so don't be confused. I meant mu of X. 
the expectation of x. So now I have n of those divided by n, that's one of them minus one, and so the bias of this particular estimator, which I have called u half of x, is zero. That um, expectation of mu hat x, that's um, like when you take multiple samples, right? That is that uh, quasi-philosophical notion is that you're saying, look, my, ex my definition of how I'm going to estimate the location of a data set is by taking n samples and summing and averaging them. And now you, you subscribe to the higher level notion that you could do that many, many, many times with a set of identically distributed such samples. So that's the notion of, I'm gonna base my estimate on 20 humans whose length I will sum an average. And it's not written as a sum, it's not written as a limit, it's not written, but it's, it's assumed now that you are able to conduct that experiment n times a hundred, a million, and so on times such that you can learn something about what you will get if you do it that way on average. So in other words, this constructed from data thing has moment properties. It has itself an expectation and it has itself a variance. And that's what we mean by the expectation of the estimator. And if you do want to think about this as, as doing that experiment involving 20 humans a million times and then n going to, uh, n going to infinity, the million going to infinity, then yeah, you could, you could, you could think about that. Does that clarify it? So that's a, it's a crucial step, right? You have a sample of a certain size and that's your estimator, sum, divide. And then you're saying, aha, that itself has a distribution. And I'm just about only right now figuring out what the expectation of that sampling distribution is. And I subtract truth to say, aha, that estimator is unbiased by my definition. What right. does um, that IID abbreviation mean in your definition again? In the, I'm writing it here. I didn't really use it yet. But it's how we start by thinking. Um, because we'll need it in a minute. I always like to think about something that is crazy and violates that. And that is, all right, you've taken 20 humans and you're taking 20 different doctors, but they're all using the same broken rulers. Then there's gonna be a systematic error, a bias, then that's clearly not independently distributed and so on because they're using the same broken ruler, right? So uh, independent, identically distributed samples here. So if that's clear, I'll just continue. Bias, check, looking good. So now I'm gonna ask, well, what is the variance of this MX estimator? I could do it a long way and I'll show you in the notes. How about I do it the short way? I'll say, okay, well, what do I need? I need to characterize the expectation of the distance of that thing that I'm using as my estimator to the truth, that thing that I want to know, squared. I'm just third time today, I'm writing the definition of variance. But I have already used the fact that the expectation of the estimator was unbiased, which means that that is n times n n divided by n of u x, or I'm actually already substituting that here, right? The definition of the variance includes the expectation with respect to whose distance you're working. In this case, well, that's actually already that. But that's what I want to know. Um, I can just continue on and say, all right, well, I'm going to call that var, because I've used that before. And I'm gonna just write what I'm actually using as my estimator, which is one over n, i is one to n of my 
values, my samples that I take. And just because I want to do this quickly, if you went with the left equation, and I'll have it in the notes, you'll see it's a little grunge work. And, and um, Ben Knapp and Pearsall in their chapter that I made you read, they are doing that. So of course, I could go with this here, already using the unbiasedness. And now if I'm already also using the fact that these X's are independently distributed and therefore are uncorrelated and therefore have no covariance. And then I use the rule that I derived last lecture, which is just a quadratic nature of how to work with variances in general, then this is the square of the constant, and then the sum of the variances of the thing inside. Now I'm using the a dot covariance of the thing dot a, where a is just a set of weights, one, 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 the first example that I had and then I uh, asked a question and then that was the vector that I first said was a matrix, but it's just a sum of the x's. And so applying that rule, you're getting a linear combination, a bilinear combination of the covariance, but it's IID. So this independence implies lack of correlation and that lack of correlation explains how the variance of this sum generates no covariance terms and therefore because i started by saying this thing exists not only is there no covariance but also they have a common variance and i have called that common variance sigma x squared XI, um, does that represent just one single data point? So XI is one single data point, but you are mentally imaging that this is part of a set of 20, say, and that you can take multiple such sets because every time you take a data point, you're accessing the population in a completely independent and uncorrelated way. Every time a human walks through the door, they are not brothers, they are not sisters, they are just samples coming in. And you just bag them up in bunches of 20, send them to a random doctor with a random ruler, and you're saying, that'll be my estimate of the human height. So you have to think about this in your you know, quiet time, what that really means. Yes, that means one sample, but that sample itself is a variable that you, you must imagine that you could take and retake such that you can describe the properties of what you do to that sample statistically, which means in terms of their sampling distribution, that's what we're getting to. And so here's the population distribution, the, the, the drawing, and the population distribution for now only has to exist and of course, if it exists, it's going to have a location if it's not mental. And it's going to have a spread if it's not infinity, which is the same as saying it exists. It means it's, it's, it's knowable. Okay. And um, well, independently identically distributed means that they're all drawn from the same population. So there's only ever one variant, sigma squared of x. And every sample, a single one or a bag of 20, they're all coming from that distribution. And so that relates to the property X. And now when I ask for the variance of this linear combination of these X's, then applying my covariance propagation rule from last lecture, noticing that I have a common variance, which I give a single name, and no covariance terms, this brings out the fact that that is the sum of variances. Unlike a previous example where it might have been an X and a Y and they would be drawn from two different populations, as we will we'll get to soon enough. Now, one last thing, I'm gonna write it down so we can uh, reflect on that for a second. And so I just wanna finish this with the, with the bottom line here, that that ends up as N times that single existing thing divided by N. 
which means this particular estimate for the location of a population derived from n samples, one sample of n, but treated as a distribution, is on average equal to the truth, therefore unbiased, and has a variance that is the true variance divided by however many samples I take, which is great because it means that if I take more and more samples, larger and larger bags of humans, then my rate of decay of my variance is one over n, and that is phenomenal. That's the best I can do, which is thanks to IID. I'm not telling you that that's the best rate. Um, I'm not proving to you that that's the best I can do, but I'm already saying that in this case, that is the best you can do. And so one over n is the magic rate for all variances. There was uh, an additional clarification, so I'd be happy to do it again. Yeah, um, if, if xi is just one single data point um, instead of like a random variable, then what does the variance of a data point mean rather than the variance of a random variable? So what sort of signs are you interested in? Computational biology. Okay, so you must think of rats that are cloned. And so they come from a population that are all wrapped and they're all, you know, knowable. And you might want to compute something or other in their genes. And your sample that you take might be, yes, X sub I might be that one data point. You take one rat and you sequence its DNA and you know it all within, you know, perfectly. And so you're saying that's really just a number, right? And I'm saying, yes, that's true. But you now must imagine that you have access to another sample of that same population, another rat, a clone rat, and you do the same computation on it. But because it's another rat, drawn at random from that same population, you're gonna get a different result. But the parent population is still a two parameter thing with a truth and a certain you know, expectation and a certain variance. And so um, in another science, it might be a replicate. Um, in in, in um, you know, Meteorology, it might be me today with my temperature thermometer outside, and then some other person walks in and measures at the exact same time in the exact same place with their thermometer. And each time we're saying, yes, the um, sample may be as large or as small, it's only characterized by the number of measurements that you take. But that's data. And the data are drawn, they are realizations of the population. And so in principle, they can be redrawn. They can, there can be um, multiple replicates. There can be multiple clone rats. There can be multiple thermometers. And it's a hairy notion. It's not easy to think about this. You know, Earth, we only have one Earth. So what on Earth are we talking about, about saying what is the variance of the measurement of Earth? Well, there is the higher notion that there are multiple Earths, that we can replicate the experiment. But that is admittedly philosophical. So all distributions from samples, all sampling distributions, and here we're only looking at their mean, and we're only looking at their variants are predicated upon that notion that you're treating your sample, your data set as something that is a random draw according to the distribution of the population of the things that you want to know and that you can take another random draw, but if only mentally. And so I alluded to this in, the, in another lecture um, that, that, that must be a little bit mind boggling, right? Because we are on the way to trying to characterize from 20 data what the distribution is of, the, of, of their population means. We're trying to do the reverse problem. We're trying to say, I only have one data set. I don't have time to imagine anything else. 
I need to derive from it what my likely range of models is that I can support. That's the from left to right question. Here, we're on the way to answering that question, but we're going from the right to the left. We're saying, let's begin with a population. It has parameters. I want to know them. Let's draw a sample that if I can say let's draw a sample, I must assume that I can draw another sample and another sample and another sample after that and then I can characterize the sampling distribution this way, even though in reality you may not be able to do it. And then the third leg of that is that we'll, we'll turn that around and we'll say, aha, now knowing what the distribution is of having done this experiment under the truth, we'll turn it around and say, what will be the distribution of possible truth that we can derive from having done this experiment only once? Uh, one of the books that I will maybe refer to it, they call it, maybe it's actually Bennett and Pearsall, there's something, there's some term where like, this is like a staggering mental leap. And that's what you're asking right now to make, to make that leap. So bag of humans, in principle, you can take another bag of humans, another one after that. Identical procedure, except again, different doctors, different rulers, independent, identically distributed variables. Your procedure for getting to the population value is just sum and divide. Well, these x's are random variables, which are by definition, every x is distributed like the population. And so that is their expectation. The constant is a constant, that's just a number unbiased. Its variance is related to the unknown true variance that you want to know and it's divided by the number that went into your estimation procedure in a way that shows us that as n grows large the rate is 1 over n and your m hat of x really does grow go to the thing you want to know. And that's maybe back to the first lecture where we operate under that belief. This is again, it's philosophy. That if you take more and more things that in principle you have access to the truth, well here this makes it sort of mathematically precise and in this way, at n goes to infinity, the variance of your estimate made from a sample of 20 of the location of the population where you're sampling from goes to zero and the value itself in expectation goes to the truth which means you have reached a perfect state of knowledge about it. Frederick I have a question. Quest away. Okay when you wrote down um, the variance down here so like under where yeah so isn't that mean squared error and if so is that just because mean squared error is equal to variance when you don't have bias? Yeah. Okay. Okay. That you are makes repeating my words in a order in which I didn't say them, but they are nonetheless true. I was pointing to this here. I'm shortcutting the variance definition to the thing minus the expectation of the thing squared in expectation. I'm shortcutting that here because I've just discovered that the expectation of a thing that is just a population parameter, I mean, it doesn't. Like that's a constant, that's the thing that I say exists. Mm -hmm. And that's the same as using the unbiasedness by saying I just want the variance, which means I actually really want the, the mean square error and I'm just writing that down. So uh, I'll send you the, some longer derivation and you, this is a good time to really read the Bendat and Pearsall about this because you know you, you could find different ways of writing it down and you could get stuck. And then the next thing we're going to do is to talk about the estimate of the variance, its bias, its expectation, its variance, its rate of decay. And then we will proceed with other things.